Hi guys, Miss Blanchard here. Um, okay, so we're picking up where we left off. Um, I think it's slide 13 on the um, the slides file that I posted. Um, it does, and I've noted it on, sorry, I'm pointing at you like you can see. I've noted on the slide here that's page 12 of your packet. Um, so we are gonna pick up on page 12. For some reason, the uh, monitor, the video is working now. I don't know what I did last time. Um, so let's go over our key concepts for this video, our key topics. Um, we're gonna go through these pretty quickly because they intersect with a lot of your research projects. So um, our key question, explain the causes of economic growth in the years after World War II. And I had already given you that notation that after that period of economic downturn after World War II, um, because all these people come back, these GIs come back, they're unemployed, um, we don't um, need as much product being produced. So a lot of government contracts are canceled. Um, the agricultural sector is not having to produce at um, overcapacity. Um, so at least an economic downturn. After that, the U.S. economy experienced unprecedented growth um, for the next 20, maybe even 25 years, really into the late 60s and early 70s. So our key concept that you can annotate here as we go along is the burgeoning, that means growing private sector, federal spending, the baby boom, and technological developments help spur economic growth. We have two more uh, we're going to be looking at. Um, we'll go over all three of them and come back to them. Um, we won't go over all three of them in depth, but just to give you a little preview. Um, then we're going to be looking at the same key topic, the economy, but this time um, on page 13, uh, the key question, explain the causes and effects of the migration of various groups of Americans after 1945. Um, and the key concept here, as higher education opportunities and new technologies rapidly expanded, increasing social mobility inc uh, encouraged the migration of the middle class to the suburbs and of many Americans to the South and West. The Sun Belt region emerged as a significant political and economic force. Then we'll also be taking a look at key concept 8.5 about culture, First to our economy, this is culture after 1945 on page 14. Uh, the key question being explain how mass culture has maintained or challenged the status quo over time. And the key concept about mass culture became increasingly homogeneous in the post-war years, inspiring challenges to conformity by artists, intellectuals, and rebellious youth. Okay, so let's start with that uh, on page 12. Sorry, my thing's going off. ALEXA over here. Let's see down. Um, okay, let's start off on page 12. Explain the causes of economic growth in the years after World War II and the burgeoning private sector, federal spending, and the baby boom and technological developments help spur economic development. We actually don't do with, uh, a lot with technological development in this presentation. We'll kind of come back to it later, um, but let's start with this. So the GI Bill of Rights, and I had mentioned, captioned that in one of the previous key concepts. Um, I had mentioned that when a lot of these GIs, government soldiers, sailors, um, Marines come home um, after World War II, women are told to go back into the home, um, do their patriotic duty and give their jobs back to men. Um, but still, jobs are going to be um, uh, hard to find. And you actually hear discrepancies. European soldiers who come home from the European front actually get to come home early. Um, soldiers who then come home from the Pacific Front because the fighting goes on there or longer. Some don't come home until 1946. Um, really, the Pacific soldiers have a really hard time finding jobs because a lot of the available jobs have already gone to European theater GIs. So what comes about in Congress is something called the GI Bill of Rights. Um, as men came home, uh, Congress approves the Servicemen's Readjustment Acts. That's the formal name of it. Most people will call it the GI Bill of Rights, but if you ever see it, um, like the Source Information Servicemen Readjustment Act, know that it's talking about the GI Bill of Rights. So um, a lot of people focus on just college education, um, and I've tried to, especially the groups that are doing the research paper, try to get you to understand that it's more than just education. Education is going to be important. This is going to me make the best educated generation um, America has ever seen. And in the 1960s, their children will then become the next best educated generation. But it also gives low cost mortgages and low interest loans to start a business. And then here, cash payments of tuition and living and expenses to attend college, high school or vocational uh, education, um, as well as one year of unemployment compensation. So as these GIs come home, they get a one year of unemployment um, and this is one reason that um, many people, uh, many Republicans don't want to pass unemployment and an increase to minimum wage 
um, in Truman's Fair Deal, as they say, the GI Bill has already done it for Americans that we want to give it to. But um, you can get uh, home ownership is going to expand. Um, small businesses are going to expand and personal businesses as well as education. Um, it was available to active duty, even non-combat uh, veterans. I think they had to have at least a year of service, but the, again, it didn't have to be con um, combat only. And they had to have an honorable discharge. Um, and so by 1956, about a year, 10 years, a decade after World War II is done, um, roughly 2.2 million veterans had attended college or university, and an additional 6.6 .6 million used these benefits for some kind of training program. Um, and so this starts to work us into one of our key concepts about increased social mobility um, to World War II vets, creating a better educated and more affluent public. Um, yeah, and we start to kind of get into that. If you flip to page 13 quickly, um, the key concept there is higher education opportunities. That would be the GI Bill um, uh, and new technologies rapidly expanded. Increased social mobility encourage the migration of blah, blah, blah. Part of that increased social mobility means we're going to have um, or is because we're going to have more um, white collar jobs, more doctors, more lawyers, but more teachers, more, you know, anything you need a bachelor's or even a master's. Um, to do, we're going to have more of in the United States, leading to social mobility. So I had said, you know, women were told their patriotic duty was to leave the workforce and go back into the home. So women in the workforce is actually women not in the workforce. Um, and this becomes um, a second cult of domesticity. I should have put that in the slide. Um, maybe I will do that right now. Um, women move out of factories. There's, you know, Rosie the Riveter is told to go home. Um, and the idea of a stay at home mom became more common and was actually pushed by the famous child psychologist, Dr. Spock. Um, women were told like, this is the best way to raise healthy, well-adjusted children is, I don't know why this is not, I think I have too much going on on my computer right now. Uh, okay. Well, it's not going to let me do that. I'll add it in later. Yeah, we'll see. Um, and I should have read ahead. Um, second, um, cult of domesticity. College attendance by women dropped as women skipped college or left college early to start a family. Um, sometimes if you watch uh, older movies, you'll even hear like the joke, oh, she got her MRS degree, um, MRS being Mrs., like a married woman. Um, you know, some women who went to college really did it to find a well-educated husband, a middle-class husband, start a middle-class life. Um, they're not, you know, some women are not there to start careers uh, and get career training in the 1950s in college. Um, and so this is part of the women's rights movement, though. Um, we'll read a source later by Betty Friedan, is that many of these women, and we already read the one source um, uh, by Gwinnett, I can't remember her first name, from World War II, that women enjoyed during the war having their own income, having their own schedules and responsibilities, and having their own independence. And so when it's abruptly taken away from them and they're, they're sent back into the second cult of domesticity, there's kind of an undercurrent of dissatisfaction that's going to come spilling out in the women's rights movements of the 1960s and 70s. But you take these returning GIs and women um, and you get a baby boom. Um, so birth rates had been suppressed during the 1930s and 40s. Great Depression, men are at wars. Uh, men are at war, you're not having as many births. Um, so after World War II ended, men came home and, and life changed. Um, there's 2.3 million marriages, which um, is a big marriage spike. And there, people are marrying younger and younger more often. Um, the average married age for men, 22, and women is 20, uh, quite young. And so here is the birth rate. Here, another picture. Here's the end of World War II here in this famous, um, I think it's VE Day uh, in New York City photograph. Um, and here is this spike, you know, right after as soldiers are coming home in the 46, 47, maybe even to 48, um, this huge spike. Um, there's a little dip here, but then this general trend line going up and up and up is known as the baby boom. And you see it's still pretty high until about here, until about 1964. And I know I've mentioned this in class. The only, um, you know, it's ended really by the um, availability of birth control, the first time legally and safely um, birth control as in um, prevention um, uh, being available in 1964. So um, this baby boom, maternity wards are overflowing, education is going to be in demand. During the 1950s, California would on average open up a school per week to handle increased enrollment throughout the decade. 
1957, the baby boom peak, there were five point, I'm sorry, 4.3 million births. Um, and by 1964, four in 10 Americans were under the age of 20. So our natural national average age is going down. Um, West Essex itself is very much a uh, response to this. The, the, the need to build this additional high school in the community comes much from this baby boom and you know, where are all these kids going to go to high school um, in, in the next decade. Um, West Essex itself is also a, um, a, a result of the interstate highway system. Um, you know, look outside, you have 280 over by Roseland uh, and Essex Fells, and by North Caldwell, um, yeah, by North Caldwell and Fairfield, you have Route 80. Both of these are part of the Eisenhower Highway System, or so it was called. So in 1956, Congress approves the construction of an interstate highway. Um, it's um, inspired by the Germany's Autobahn, um, which construction had begun on. Uh, and it's going to follow the same lines that many railroads had followed um, and still, you know, link the same cities together, uh, link major cities, make movement easier. And, and I know I mentioned this on the first day of class, make it able for us to defend ourselves in time of nuclear attack, right? The, the highways are made uh, wide enough to accommodate um, small aircraft if needed for mobilization. Um, underpasses and overpasses are made high enough uh, to handle those same aircrafts as well as um, troop transports and even tanks if needed. This is really a defense um, need that leads to a, a social and cultural change in the United States. Um, so how is this republicanism? It doesn't seem like, you know, today's republicanism, but Eisenhower's modern republicanism, republicanism made it fiscally responsible by paying for its construction through a revenue tax on gas, tires, trucks, and buses. So a usage tax, those people who are going to actually use it are going to be taxed to pay for it. I'd love to hear what Chris has to say about it. Oh, no, wait, I wouldn't. Okay, so this highway system, um, all of these young people getting married is going to lead to, to a whole change in our culture. Um, by 1960, there's over 10,000 miles of highways. Um, today, there are 45,000 miles. So, you know, you know, a 280 isn't built until much later, but it's part of, you know, a system that's set up in the 1950s. It makes it a status symbol to own a car. And I would say really by the late 1950s and early 1960s, like you just have to own a car. Um, it becomes like the new norm. Um, however, what kind of car you own, that becomes a status symbol. So very similar to the 1920s, you have this era of conspicuous consumption. And one of those conspicuous ways is now a car that you can park in your driveway, that you can drive about town to different places. It helps promote a national defense and interstate trade and vacation travel. Um, here I put down Holiday Inn, um, new uh, highway destinations to pull over and take pictures of. Um, people start going to the seashore for vacations, and vacations really become um, a product of the 1950s and eventually the 1960s. So when Americans really started vacationing. Uh, so life in the suburbs increasingly became um, blue or white collar, so working class or the educated professions um, living in, in the same neighborhoods, so though this will change, um, especially when we start getting to the 80s, for instance. Uh, suburbs and suburbians depended on cars for um, grocery stores and shopping malls, uh, unlike the city where you often like walk to a corner grocer. Um, they allowed for the nuclear family, no longer the extended family. Now you're going to have this new nuclear age and nuclear family, a mom, a dad, and children. Um, I think the 1960 uh, census reports that it was 2.4 children. Um, not the extended family or traditional families that some areas might have been used to, especially in agricultural areas. And when I think we come back to this later, but this issue of white flight to the suburbs, um, and we will come back to that. Okay, um, so one case study that a couple groups did this week was Levittown in New York out on Long Island. Um, it begins in 1947 with some rental homes to veterans and expands uh, by 1951, 17,000 homes are sold. And so if you think, um, you know, 2.4, people living in each one of those homes, you have, you know, almost like 40,000 people, no, over 40,000, uh, almost 60,000 uh, people. In the original Levittown, you had two different uh, models to choose from, the Cape Cod or the ranch. If you look there, they're actually pretty similar, just the exterior is a little bit different, um, but very much a culture of conformity. By 1960, a third of the U.S. population lives in the suburbs. This is the time period 
in which Fairfield starts to rapidly expand. Fairfield is actually the oldest of the four towns that send to West Essex. Um, but this is also when Roseland is created. The old Roseland farm is um, started to be subdivided into um, more suburban individual lots and, and sold to developers. So um, Essex Wells had um, many of the homes that existed uh, before this time period. Um, North Caldwell, I'm not so sure about. I think a lot of the construction of North Caldwell comes more in the 60s and the 70s. Um, but you see these very, um, especially in the 1950s, cookie cutter neighborhoods. Um, I think we do a better job of making suburban neighborhoods a little bit better today. Um, and this is also going to lead into a whole car culture, as I said earlier, that car, cars become a status symbol. Um, I don't think I have anybody doing a particular car model um, this year for research papers. I know one group is doing GM and one group is doing cars in general, I believe. Um, and none of this is really new information. I kind of just put it on there for the pictures. That Corvette looks pretty cool. Um, car culture also becomes where we eat. Lots of groups are doing McDonald's this year um, that you can drive up. Um, you have early drive-ins, not just McDonald's, but other restaurants where you eat in your car. Um, uh, Howard Johnson's uh, motels would be these roadside motels that you would drive and you could just stop there for the night. You could stop and eat something. So they're both a hotel and a restaurant for motorists. Um, sometimes we call them like motor lodges. And the drive-in movie actually invented here in New Jersey in Camden in the 1950s. Sorry, I'm, if my screen's wobbling. I'm, I'm crossing my legs. Um, and that, you know, if you've ever seen like the movie Grease, right? Stand Stranded at the drive-in. Um, you know, really becomes a part of the culture of the 1950s and early 60s. And it's all car culture um, because of the highway system. And something that should look very familiar to us um, here in New Jersey are the first shopping malls. In the 1920s, I believe we had looked at a, a picture of um, the first um, uh, something country club out in Kansas City, uh, first shopping mall, but it was an outdoor mall outdoor mall, what we here in New Jersey would call strip malls. These are the first indoor malls, very much a product of air conditioning and um, refrigeration systems. If you remember, air conditioning is actually invented during the World's Fair, which you should, be, should have read about this summer in your summer reading book. Um, but this is really like now the modernization, the real practica, practicality um, and full scale ability of air conditioning. Um, but again, you have one big centralized location, you drive your car there, um, not always on an interstate, most likely just city roads, but you could use an interstate um, shop, load all your bags in, and then drive home. This kind of area usage would not have been um, able to do in urban areas. Uh, and also you couldn't have carried like tons of bags home with you. It's good to have a car to do that. Um, how does this relate to NSC 68? Um, you know, NSC 68 is a lot of the spending. A lot of the people who are living in these suburbs Maybe not be working for the government, but maybe working in industries, um, in science, technology, research, development, chemicals, um, engineering um, that are supporting government contracts. What the government is going to do in the 1950s under Eisenhower is the government does do some R&D, um, mainly like top secret research. But most of our research and development, most of our scientific innovation is going to be happening in corporations that then have partnerships with the government. Again, very much a flashback to the 1920s and the associative state that you still have a government, you still have private business, but they work together for mutual progress. So you see large corporations um, like IBM, Dow Chemical, lots of other chemical and technology companies um, that support our military and military research. Um, and so it leads to what I think the key concept is called a burgeoning private sector. Um, leads to a buildup of a technology sector. I think one or two groups are doing like the first supercomputer, which we'll come back to and mention later, and like the transistors that are going to allow the proliferation of home electronics. Um, the old radios of the 1920s that were basically like an entire chest of drawers in size are now going to be able to become a little transistor radio. Um, you know, that can sit on your, your desktop or can sit in your dashboard of your car. Um, and so very much NSC 68 represents the force behind the Cold War boom and movement towards white collar jobs and affluency. Um, so this creates this affluent society. You can add more to your notes there on page 12. Um, a desire for consumer goods, which had been suppressed during the 1930s and 40s, um, 
uh, you know, Americans want to buy things again, and they are, they're able to buy things again. You have government spending during the Cold War and the baby boom and movement to the suburbs led to demand for consumer goods, record players, cars with automatic transmissions, televisions, filter cigarettes, um, refrigerators, and other home appliances. Um, I know that John Green video from the 20s was obsessed with toaster ovens, but now you see refrigerators and other types of ovens, uh, vacuum cleaners, all types of home electronics. Uh, but this affluence led to a shift from individualism to conformity, uh, which is a topic we we'll, we come back to again and again. So let's just wrap up the key questions there. What are the causes of economic growth in the years after uh, World War II? I think we just addressed them if you want to back up here for a second. Um, and so you have a burgeoning private sector, which I just mentioned verbatim, um, federal spending on the highways, on military R&D, um, and the baby boom, um, and technological development helps spur economic growth. So let's start to go into on page 13, the next one we're going to be talking about is uh, the Sun Belt. So explain the causes and effects of migration of various groups of Americans after 1945. As higher education opportunities, like the GI Bill I just mentioned, and new technologies rapidly expanded, increasing social mobility encouraged the migration of the middle class to the suburbs and of many Americans to the South and West. And we just talked about the suburbs a little bit. Um, but here, what we really want to hit on, too, is the Sun Belt region emerged as a significant political and economic force. That's the one we're really going to focus on. I'm just going to preface, um, give you a little preview of um, 8.5 culture, so you can kind of keep it in the back of your mind and put it in the parking lot there, pardon the car pun, um, explain how mass culture has maintained or challenged the status quo over time. Um, and mass culture has become increasingly homogeneous in the post-war years, inspiring challenges to conformity and artist, intellectual, and, and, uh, artist, intellectuals, and rebellious youth. Actually, I'm going to stop it there so the videos don't get too long, and that's where we'll pick up next time.